sky. That's the message. Welcome back to another episode of Give Me Some Truth International. Dites moi la vérité. Uh, Dites moi la, la verdad. Uh, and then how do we say it in Portugal? Portuguese? How, how do we say it in Portuguese? A verdade. Beautiful. So uh, as you've noticed, we have a, a very special guest here today, Isabel Quintero from uh, Henley and Partners, and she'll talk a little bit about what Henley and Partners do, and I, I think we'll also provide some kind of general in, insight into kind of the world of, of uh, kind of cross-border movement that we're seeing quite a bit of and some of the more popular destinations and so on and so forth. I'm Keith Ponywas. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, uh, Sil Michelin and Stan Farmer with Isabel Quintero, as I mentioned. And uh, so just to kind of uh, get things underway, Isabel, why don't you tell us a little bit about Henley and Partners and what all you do, uh, if you could kind of introduce what you guys do to, to our audience. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with, he, uh, with you guys today and happy weekend. <laughs> I'm not sure which day. This will be on the air. I was going to say happy yeah. Friday, but um, I guess, I guess, um, guess um, we, we can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Isabel Quintero. I'm a director of client advisor for Henley and Partners in the Miami office, which is the headquarter for the Americas. Henley and Partners is a global leader in investment migration. Basically, we have two lines of business. One is government advisory. We help governments create and implement into migration programs that can attract foreign investment into their countries. In fact, we created the industry because the first program that was launched worldwide was St. Kitts and Nevis over 25 years ago, and it was designed by Henley. After that, we have created 15 different government um, advisory mandates worldwide. So that's one part of business. The other one is we specialize in helping individuals and their families obtain alternative residence and or citizenship by investment in 40 different countries. We are a team um, located in 42 different offices worldwide. We have helped over 25,000 clients worldwide, and we have been able to raise $12 billion in foreign investment. So more or less, that's who we are. <laughs> And, and so, you know, uh, how long have Henley & Partners been around and what drew you to working at, at Henley & Partners as well? Absolutely. So it's one of those beautiful coincidences <laughs> um, in the world. So a little bit of my background is I, I did seven years of private banking in Miami. Then I did seven years of um, real estate internationally. A residential real estate in Mexico, commercial real estate in Arizona, and then project marketing in Sydney, Australia. And um, investment migration is just a perfect mix of both right. uh, private banking and my real estate background into this new industry that, to be completely honest, was new for me. And I think yeah, no. it's new for a lot of you guys that are listening as well. Um, I feel that a lot of people have ideas of where they want to go or where they would like to move to or alternative passports, et cetera. But they don't really know that there's this industry and that there's a company like Henley and Partners that can help them with those. Um, and needs. so Isabel, for, so for clients who are viewers who may not be familiar with, with the industry. So can you, can you explain just what is citizenship or residency by investments? Can you give us a couple of examples of, of maybe the more successful programs? Absolutely, 100%. So basically, we offer two type of programs worldwide. One is a residency program. The other ones are citizenship programs. What is the main difference? And this is very important for people to understand. A residence program, it's a program that will give you um, the um, option to reside in that country, to study in that country. In many scenarios, depending on the country, uh, the ability to work as well. So it's pretty much like the equivalent of a green card in the U.S., right? However, a, that could be revocable. It is not uh, permanent, meaning like a citizenship, like a passport, doesn't give you the right to vote, and it's not going to be passed on down to future generations. So a citizenship program, it's a straight path to a passport. 
There are currently nine countries worldwide that offer citizenship programs. Five countries in the Caribbean, we have St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica, Grenada, Antigua, and St. Lucia. We have Turkey, Egypt, and then there's Austria and Malta in Europe. So more or less, that's the difference between the programs. Um, citizenship programs are very popular, especially for our American clients, uh, even though 95% of our clients are not looking to change their residency. So they want to continue to live in the US uh, for the time being. They just want to have an alternative passport as a right. plan B. And so the investment piece of this is effectively, this is a passport or residency right, which is contingent on someone making an investment in, in, in that country. Is that right? That is correct. So each country has different rules, different requirements, and also different investment routes. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> My apologies. So, for example, Spain. Spain has a golden visa program. One of the investment routes is investment in real estate. So you can invest 500,000 euros in real estate, and that's going to grant you a residence permit in Spain. As long as you maintain your investment, you maintain your residence permit. Now, that residence permit can convert to a citizenship but there's always a requirement. In the case of Spain specifically, you are required to reside in Spain for 10 years. 10 years for everybody who is not an Ibero-American citizen. Ibero-American citizens, so Latin uh, people like me, I'm originally from Colombia, um, also people from the Fili Philippines and uh, Sephardic Jews, instead of 10 years, they're required to reside in Spain for two years. And after that, you can apply for your passport. So each country has different rules, as I mentioned. Um, just to contrast um, Spain, um, let me tell you, for example, about Greece. In Greece, you can also invest in real estate, but the lowest threshold is 250,000 euros. However, you will have to reside in Greece for seven years before being able to apply for citizenship. Got it. And so what would be thinking about your American clients. So can you give us an example of a typical client situation that you may be dealing with? What are their, you know, what are they trying to solve? What are their, their motivations in seeking advice from people well, like you? Well, very quickly, I can speak to that. The, the uh, Caribbean sounds fantastic <laughs> right now <laughs> as it's uh, <laughs> negative five degrees outside of our <laughs> office. So, I think, so as yeah. a climate diversification, yeah. <laughs> which sounds very welcoming yeah. now. Right. So <laughs> right, I, good point. So is it lifestyle and weather related or is there more to the story? Well, it's actually a, a mix of uh, different reasons. So I'll tell you guys some of those. The first one, and I personally always ask my clients, what is the reason why you are pursuing this? Why do you want to obtain alternative uh, citizenship or alternative residency? The answers are, first one, just to have a plan B. Some people are concerned about your political tensions that may arise within the US and other countries. So uh, for those people that only have an American passport, they want to have an exit strategy in case that they need to leave the US, where are they going to move to? And with the American passport, you can only um, visit a place for 90 days out of 180 day period, right? right? So that brings us to our second reason, freedom of mobility. We have a lot of people that don't want to be limited by these rules, which we all fall into with whatever passports we have, right? We can only visit a place for 90 days out of 180 day period. But what if you want to go and stay in, let's say, Italy for six months every year, or you know, be able to travel in Europe freely, just to give you an example. So in order to do that, you need another passport. A lot of people do it because they want to eventually retire somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So they need to start planning ahead. Um, some other people do it because of education purposes for their children. So if you guys have kids, you know how expensive colleges are, especially in the US. And everybody or the majority of people graduate with huge amounts in debt from um, student loans, right? But in reality, you can invest um, in one of these residency programs 
uh, let's say in Europe, eventually become a citizen and then have your kids attend amazing schools in Europe and have access to 27 different countries. Right. And not only that, but it's going to be something that you're going to be passing down to future generations because specifically in the case of Europe, once you become a European citizen, that passport is going to be passed down automatically to your future grandchildren. So it's an investment not only for yourself and your current family, but also for future generations. So those are the most common reasons why our clients look for alternatives. Isabel, we... Uh... We, we spent, uh, what was it, last year? We did a, a three-part episode on, we did a three-part podcast on expatriation, I believe, right? And uh, you know, one of the things that makes us Americans different from from your European clients, from your Latin American clients, is that, that uh, as long as you're a U.S. citizen, you're a U.S. tax resident no matter where you live. So I, I, would, I would opine or assume that, that uh, this is part of the expatriation piece of the puzzle that in those three episodes we really didn't cover. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to renounce your U.S. citizenship to avoid uh, taxation in America, you got to have another passport somewhere, right? I mean, otherwise, uh, what happens if they pull your residency <laughs> permit in Dubai, right? right? Yeah. So you cannot be a <laughs> resident of nowhere, right? You have to yeah. be a citizen of somewhere. Um, so you cannot renounce your American passport without having another passport first. Now, we don't do tax advisory. So technically speaking, I cannot go deep into any tax matters. Sure. But I can tell you that even if you were to renounce to your American passport, you're still going to have to pay Uncle Sam a piece of everything you have before you leave. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And as long as you keep your American passport, uh, and this is another very frequent question that I get from, from a lot of our clients at the beginning of the process is, can I have a second or third passport? Do I have to renounce to my American passport? And the answer is, yes, you can have another passport or passports as long as all the countries that you're going to have those passports from are okay with. For example, you can become a citizen of Austria by investment, right? And once you obtain that Austrian passport, of course you can keep your American. Let's suppose that you have an American passport, you, you gain your Austrian by, uh, investment. However, Austria says that after you gain that passport by investment, you are not allowed to gain any other passport after that. So in that case, you cannot have any other passport. However, you can have a, another case scenario. You can be American, you can have a passport from, let's say, St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean, and then do another passport from Malta, and you can keep the three of them, and you can probably add another one. So it really depends on which country we're talking about and the rules that that country has. Just out of curiosity, I still collects passports. It's kind of a hobby of his. <laughs> he, ha he has three. <laughs> could, could he pick up the Austrian one without having to drop any of the ones he already has? Yes, that that's correct. Americas? He could still he could get sell. I'll get right on that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a, f a full poker hand of pot passports. Um, one thing, you know, in, in looking at, you know, some of the publications Henley and Partners have, have put out, wh what's interesting is that uh, one of the things I noted uh, noticed is that Americans are now leading kind of the trend of, of your clients. It used to be, it sounds like other, other groups uh, that there are more and more demand from Americans. And I was just curious as to two kind of two questions. What, you know, do you see as responsible for that? And then also what other kind of big picture changes have you seen in the time that you've been doing this? Absolutely. So yes, first of all, we are seeing a huge increase on uh, our American clients and in our American market looking for alternative residence and citizenship. In fact, our headquarter for the Americas was previously located in Montreal. And because we had so many inquiries from the US, we had to open up Miami and bring the headquarter to Miami. Recently, we have also opened up New York, LA. We are working on Chicago, San Francisco, Dallas as well. So imagine, um, Americans are definitely, uh, uh, America is a very important market for us. Now, 
What happened? What made them open their mind about these possibilities? I think there are two reasons. One was the pandemic. During the pandemic, which hit us like a cold shower <laughs> that we were not expecting, because if I if I told you five years ago, guys, you're going to be hit by a pandemic and then we're going to be locked in our houses for a year and a half, everybody will have said, you're crazy. And this, then this thing happened and Americans realized that, wait a second, their passport that used to give them access to 188 countries suddenly dropped to 65 countries during the pandemic. <laughs> so right. the people that didn't have an alternative passport had to stay in the U.S., the people that had alternative passports were able to go to um, somewhere else, you know, south of France or somewhere in Spain. And for a quarter of the price that you pay your apartment in New York, you live a wonderful life during the pandemic, free in the countryside by the beach or, or something. So that definitely changed people's mind and, and urged them to look for alternatives. The other thing is that we have now a big amount of millionaires, centimillionaires, and billionaires in the U.S. And the same way that wealthy individuals are planning for things like risk management, retirement planning, uh, pension structures, investment strategy, cash flow management, tax planning, trust and state planning, they're now have started to think about citizenship and residence planning. And I always like to tell my clients the same way that when you invest, you don't invest only in, let's say, shares or bonds or Bitcoin. You have a diversified portfolio because you cannot rely only on one type of investment. Why will you rely only on one password? Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in today's world where we've seen not only the pandemic that I just mentioned, but we've also seen the conflict that started between Russia and Ukraine. We've seen the conflict between Israel and, and Palestine. So anything can happen, you know, and God forbid something happens um, in, in this side of the world, but you always have to be prepared for everything. Mm -hmm. um, I also think the fact that now you can watch Netflix anywhere in the world. Right. I mean, you know, compared to French te yeah. television, Order. you know, Amazon and almost anywhere yeah. in the world. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it makes it, I do think it's a it's a big difference. So the the and one of the things I think the pandemic revealed to us is that the distances with things like Zoom, as we're doing this uh, podcast over, mm -hmm. and other things like that, have made the world feel much smaller. And you feel like it's much easier to stay in touch if you're elsewhere in the world than it was even yeah. ten or fifteen years ago. I would yeah. say we we've always had we've always been spoiled in the sense that 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 our careers of working with clients abroad kind of necessitated that we have remote, you know, video and, and phone call, you know, with clients as opposed to face-to-face. -face. But the rest of the world during the pandemic, you know, got a taste of what it's like to work remotely. And a lot of people are very reluctant to go back mm -hmm. to the way it used Absolutely. to be. Absolutely. Exactly. A lot of people like the remote life, and especially when you are a high net worth individual and you have that option of, working yes. from different places. So just to give you specific numbers, um, the global migration of high net worth individuals went from 51,000 individuals that, that migrated in 2013 to 128,000 individuals that are uh, forecast to be migrating in 2024. Wow. Wow. And I think, and, and I think Isabel, you make a great point about the need really to start planning and think about global mobility in the same way that you think about other planning issues like, you know, estate planning and, and investing and all that stuff. And, and, you know, a lot of high net worth individuals and families, they want to have options, right? And, and I think thinking ahead about, you know, what options do I have? What options do we have as a family in terms of where we want to reside long term? Um, I think is a is something that we we probably you know all need to spend more time doing and thinking about ahead of time because we we tend to be very reactive with these issues and it's kind of like oh you know my kid moved to Italy you know how how will I spend time with with my grandchildren type of thing um, really you need to think about what options you have for residency and mobility 
ahead of time. And I think yeah. uh, that's something that we definitely, even in our group, want to start incorporating more and more into our financial planning thinking. And I think it aligns very well with the work, the rest of the work that we do uh, for our client. A hundred percent. And if I may add something, um, the reason why it's so important to start planning this ahead is because some of these programs take years before they convert into citizenship. So we have a lot of people that come and say, hey, I want to move to um, Portugal in six months. Um, not, it's not possible because the approval period takes at least a year and a half. And also, meanwhile, you are able to transfer or transition from a residence to a citizenship, it's going to be at least seven or eight years for Portugal. So you need to do this with time. Another reason um, why it's important to plan ahead, it's because we can never assure or guarantee that these programs will be standing a year from now, that they're not going to be subject to change. And this is something that happened, for example, last year with two different programs. With Portugal, they used to allow investment in real estate as one of the qualified uh, investment routes to be able to apply for the golden visa. They got rid of the investment in real estate. And last minute, we were receiving calls and calls from clients worldwide saying, I want to get in, I want to get in. Like the program is ending in two weeks. It's not enough time to get you in. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and some clients that I've been talking to for a long time, they're like, I want to think about it. I will wait until next year. And it's at that moment that you kind of want to say, I told you so, <laughs> I told you to do it before. Or St. Kitts, for example, which is quite a, um, a popular program for the Caribbean, they double their thresholds uh, from one day to the other. And these things can happen. The thresholds can double, the investment routes can change, the programs can sunset because some programs already reach their goal. Right. And, and it's normal for those programs to just, you know, to be close. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, um, Isabel, you bring up something that as well, it's something that is important for us as financial professionals as well, is that the rules in these various countries, along with the rules in the U.S., are always changing. And that by having a professional there to guide, your role is to help keep them apprised of those those changes as well and say, oh, this looks like a better option now, you know, based on your circumstance. Seems to be a huge value add. It's because we are the only company that offers 40 different programs worldwide without even mentioning, of course, our reputation, our experience, um, you know, our service. But we are able to really give an honest advice to our clients. You know, when, when people go to a company or a firm that only specializes in one country, that's a country that they want to sell them, you know? I had a client, for example, last year that came to me saying that he wanted to invest in Spain. And after asking him a lot of questions, I realized that what he wanted and what his purpose was, was to eventually obtain a passport from Spain because in 10 years from now, he wanted to move and retire in Spain. However, he wasn't willing or planning or wishing to go reside in Spain before that. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to still keep on living in the U.S. for the time being. And then 10 years from now, just being able to have a, a Spanish passport and go. And it doesn't work that way. So I was able to advise them to enroll in the Portugal program. Because, and this is very important for everybody listening who wants to eventually obtain a passport, let's say in Europe, without having to reside in the country or without having to invest, um, you know, millions, which is the case of Malta and, and Austria, which I'll be happy to touch on a little bit later down the road. So Portugal is the only program for residency in Europe that will allow you to apply for citizenship without having to reside in the country. As long as you, of course, invest in one of the qualifying investment routes, maintain that investment, and you visit Portugal for seven days every year for five years. So this is something that everybody can do on the side. You can live in the U.S. and sacrifice yourself to go visit Portugal one week a year. 
<laughs> yeah, preferably yeah. in January. Yeah, twi- twi- twist my arms to go, you know, hang out in in Cash uh, you know, uh, in a golf resort for a few days. Yeah, sounds horrible. Yeah. Uh, any <laughs> other kind of uh, questions for Isabel before we let her go? Um, yeah, we, yeah, I do. I, I mean, so the the, the Portugal thing is interesting yeah, because we we spent a lot of time, um, you know, discussing Portugal. Portugal's been very explosive for Americans who want to go and live, you know, it, the, the, the citizenship component of it, you know, we don't touch on a lot, but we get, we get a lot of immigration type questions. You could imagine, like we probably get phone calls that are, that, that are, you know, better suited for Isabel to answer from time to time. Right. For people who are very curious about these programs. I'm curious to know that with Portugal changing the golden visa and of course, getting rid of NHR, in terms of people who are coming to you looking for a place to uh, obtain a passport but also live, what are the country? Uh, do, do you see a trend of, 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 of the people who didn't get in in time? Where are they going to? What tends to be popular for that cohort of, of would-be uh, American immigrants, if you will? So you mean the people who didn't get in time with the real estate investment for Portugal, yeah? Correct. Yeah, well, they got rid of that route, but there are other routes available. You can still contribute 250,000 towards cultural yes. activities and, and development. You can invest 100,000 in an investment um, fund, for example, and that's quite a popular option for our American clients. So you can still do that. You can still invest right. in Portugal and be able to obtain the, the golden visa. So the answer to where are they leaving uh, instead of Portugal is still Portugal, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because when it comes to Europe, as I mentioned, and in you don't want to reside or you cannot reside in a country in order to obtain that passport, which is the case of Italy, right? In Italy, you can invest. You will have to have to reside in Italy for 10 years before applying to a passport. In Greece, you can invest. You will have yes. to reside in Greece for seven years before applying to a passport. Mm-hmm. In Spain, you can invest. You will have to reside for 10 years or two years if you are an Ibero-American citizen, and then you can apply to the passport. If you don't want to reside in Europe to obtain a passport, which options do you have? And this is a very good question. You have three options. You have Portugal. Austria. Portugal is a residency program. So it has a path to a citizenship that will take you about seven years. Okay. From uh-huh. now, if we were to start today until the moment that you obtain your passport, we're talking at about seven years. Besides that, we have two citizenship programs. We have Austria and we have Malta. Right. Yeah. Well, and just... those are straight path. Absolutely, Isabel. But I'm wondering about the people who don't mind living in these countries. Now that Portugal is no longer as tax friendly, and now that Portugal isn't allowing your home purchase to count towards the golden visa, I'm just curious: are 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 you seeing a pickup in interest in Greece and Italy because of those changes in Portugal? No, no. not at no, not at all. That is interesting. That is very counterintuitive to me, <laughs> well, but that's really fascinating to know. Well, and I think, you know, probably one of the reasons there is Italy and Greece, you know, their programs are much more restrictive in terms of where you can live and what you can do, Italy, especially for, sure. for the for the real estate portion of it. So I imagine that has a, a big part of it to do. It sounds like, uh, Isabel, we have quite a bit more we could touch on. Uh, we're bumping up against our time here. Um, so we'd love to have you back on again to, to chat more about some of these things in other parts of the world where, where people are, are looking to go. But we want to thank you, and we also want to thank you. You're, you're the uh, first person to join us since our podcast hit 1,000 subscribers. So, uh, you know, yeah, uh, that's all due to Stan. Um, and uh, viral Stan, as he's known. Um, but, the, the, um, but we want to thank you for, for coming on. But we also want to thank our listeners and maybe as well, if they have questions for Isabel, if, if you're willing to join us, maybe a couple of months down the road, we can get some listener questions as well and, and get some more information. So really thank you for everything that you shared. Absolutely. Thank you guys for the invite. I really enjoyed it a lot. 
um, and congratulations on your 1,000 subscribers. <laughs> I wish well, you that you multiply that number for this 2024. <laughs> and absolutely, I'll be happy to return any time that you guys uh, want me back. I'll be happy to be back. And I don't know if there's a possibility to perhaps share my email if we have people or, you know, my information or something if we have people interested or if they have any questions, you know, I'm always happy to help. Yep. No, we'll, we'll definitely include your email on this and, and really want to thank you again. And yeah, if, if folks are interested, Henley and Partners, they've been a great resource for us as well in their research as well as Top Notch. So you should check out their, their website for all of that. Maybe we can, you know, see the same sort of exponential increase like they are seeing in, you know, high net worth uh, individuals moving between between countries. Maybe maybe we can open more offices in in places that Isabel's uh, company have offices, <laughs> in, and we can diversify our citizenships yeah. like Sale has. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, thank you, and thank you all for listening to Give Me Some Truth. Thank you. Thank you. Walker Condon Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Registration with the SEC does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The opinions expressed by the participants of this podcast are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Walker Condon Financial Advisors. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Viewers are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. You gotta leave your money behind you. Raise your hand to the sky. Ask the masses for silence.